Great. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, today we have a very interesting story in the nickel space. Uh, my name is Chad Gilfillan. I'm Senior Vice President at Red Cloud Securities. Uh, joining me today is uh, Mark Selby, Chairman and CEO of Canada Nickel. Uh, Canada Nickel uh, is an is interesting story in that it's gone quicker than most, uh, having consolidated uh, what was thought to be moose pasture uh, just outside of a major mining camp, uh, completed a consolidation of some ground, RTO'd, and suddenly have a maiden resource, uh, making it a, already a top 12 uh, nickel deposit in the world in a major mining camp. And of course, uh, already working towards a PEA. So things are moving very quickly for, for Mark and his team, uh, uh, which has uh, obviously benefited the stock as well. Uh, Mark, with that, I'll turn it over to you to to talk about Canada Nickel. Excellent, thanks, Chad. So I'll, I'll jump ahead a few slides here uh, to our introduction. Yeah, fundamentally, as Chad said, you know this is uh, exciting on multiple levels. Uh, this is a brand new company uh, with a nice tight share structure with a good group of supportive shareholders. Uh, you know, we've delivered uh, in just over six months of founding the company in September of 2019. We delivered our initial maiden resource of over 2 million tons of contained nickel uh, in just six months, uh, which makes it the 11th largest nickel sulfide discovery globally. And that's just on 20% of the overall structure. So again, we're just getting started in terms of the scale of the, the resource potential uh, of this particular asset. Uh, again, given my experience uh, advancing a similar project, Dumont at RNC, um, you know, we're able to do a lot of work very quickly. Um, we were already well advanced on the mineralogy. The first set of results came back uh, from there. And again, um, you know, better than expected in terms of the amount of recoverable nickel in both sulfide and, and iron alloy minerals. Um, the, the big thing in today's environment where you know, base companies are worried about carbon footprint, these type of nickel deposits, uh, when the uh, waste rock and tailings are exposed to air, it actually absorbs CO2 uh, naturally. So we have the potential to be a very low carbon footprint operation. Uh, we've been able to successfully raise money to advance this project. We raised six and a half million dollars privately and friends and family in the fall. Uh, despite COVID, um, we are one of the few base metal financings done in the month of April. And again, I think it's a sign of our the investor support uh, and the attention this project's got already that we raised a four and a half million dollars uh, in April. Um, and you know, our primary focus here is to deliver uh, you know a real nickel project that we think is of the scale that majors will want to own. Uh, we think we're entering a new nickel super cycle. Uh, every 15 to 20 years, nickel for some reasons that are specific to nickel, and I'll talk to them in a few slides. Uh, in the late 60s, nickel prices got to $8 a pound or $50 in today's terms. We went through another super cycle in the late 80s. Um, in the, the mid-2000s, for those of you who are investing at that time, we know nickel got up over $20 a pound. You know, and today, with you know continued strong growth in the stainless steel sector, you know, we expect to see uh, with you know the massive surge in demand coming from electric vehicles, nickel to enter another super cycle for the middle part of this decade. And we think Crawford, uh, given its location, uh, given the scale of the resource that we've established, you know we we be one of those um, you know very exciting projects you know that'll command the scarcity premium and scarcity value that we've seen for other new nickel sulfide discoveries uh, you know during prior cycles. Just a minute or two on the uh, the nickel market. Um, what drives nickel? Why does nickel have super cycles versus other commodities? It's fundamentally about high demand growth. Th this chart, you can go back in different decades and you'll see nickel continue to outperform the other base metals. It's driven by demand in stainless steel. So unlike other battery metals that are really counting on batteries to make it, um, nickel already has a massive and high growth demand base from a, a whole range of other uses. The, the, the issue and why this high demand creates these super cycles is you know, at 5%, you need to double supply every 14 years. When you're at 2%, you have to double supply every 35 years. So again, you know, why does it happen every 15 or 20 years? It's because we need to double supply, you know, every 15 to 20 years at these kind of growth rates. 
and the market you know continues to underestimate this cycle in cycle out you know and we're setting up again for this type of growth here going forward um uh, glencore this is glencore's forecast of ev demand growth so this is on top of the already high growth and demand from all the existing nickel uses. This, I would argue, is a middle of the pack forecast um, that you would see from a bunch of different commentators. Fundamentally, we need another million plus more tons of nickel just for EVs um, by the end of this decade. Uh, when you put those two things together, sort of the continued growth, and I've slowed this down to 4% growth per annum, plus another million plus tons uh, for the EV sector, you're looking at two and a half million tons more nickel by 2030. That's double the existing supply in 2018. So we have to find every mine, all of Sudbury, all of Norilsk in Russia, all of Jinchuan, all the nickel pig iron that's in China, all of the nickel pig iron that's now in Indonesia, and we have to double that within the next decade. So again, the market twitches every once in a while when we see a lot of supply coming from Indonesia. We need all of that and more. We need a million and a half to two million tons, which is three to four X what, um, Indonesia is currently producing to have any hope of balancing this market um, by the end of this decade. One fact that doesn't get enough airtime is, is just how politically uh, tight uh, the supply of nickel is going to be going forward. And as the auto industry builds their entire industry platform around nickel, um, Robert Friedland uh, quoted um, at the BMO conference two years ago saying that nickel is the new gasoline. And using that oil analogy here, uh, you've got three countries in the nickel market that control more of the global nickel supply than OPEC did at its peak in 1973. Owning nickel assets in the early 70s or acquiring nickel assets in the early 70s outside of OPEC turned out to be a great multi-decade trade. I think picking up nickel assets outside of these three countries is going to be another great multi-decade trade. Going on to the project itself, um, we're located just outside Timmins. Uh, if you drive up the highway towards Cochrane, 15 minutes outside of town, you get to the Kid Creek mine. Another 15 minutes past that adjacent to the highway is where the project's sitting. Uh, we've drilled off just to the right of the highway to date. The structure continues underneath the highway and we'll continue uh, to drive that forward uh, going forward. We have all of the infrastructure uh, we need in place in the local area. Uh, the mayor of Timmins is the next mining CEO, so this is a very supportive mining community. The First Nations group uh, we have a good relationship with, you know, and this is a region that has permitted a number of mines during the past decade. One last point that I would like to make, and, and a point that is becoming one of the most critical uh, issues for mining companies going forward, and again, particular major mining companies that we think, you know, Crawford will be the scale of asset that they will want to own. Uh, those three uh, transmission lines are all coming from hydroelectric generating stations. Um, you know, with the combination of the ability of this deposits waste rock and tailings to absorb CO2 and the, uh, the potential for all of the electricity for this project to come from hydroelectric, zero carbon hydroelectric sources, you know, this is the potential for this project to be a very low carbon footprint project. Um, you know, first question you should ask if it's just up the road from Glencore, why didn't they discover it before? Uh, you know, two key reasons. One, uh, this is an area that is under a lot of cover, so there's very little outcrop, um, which made early prospecting er uh, difficult. Um, the other key reason is that large yellow area, which is owned by Noble Mineral Exploration, and we've optioned, we own and we've optioned a bunch of properties within that larger land package. It was owned by a forestry company for many decades. Uh, that company was in and out of bankruptcy in the 90s and 2000s and, and joint venturing with junior miners was not top of the list. So you can see in the surrounding area uh, around the property, all those white dots are filed work with the Ontario government. Um, you know, this is a pr profoundly underexplored uh, land package. Uh, the good thing is geophysics does help you um, delineate the deposit. Uh, at Dumont, uh, the structure on the left there, that's a 2 billion ton resource across a six kilometer strike length. On the main Crawford deposit itself, we have over eight kilometers worth of strike length to go after. And again, we delineated a 900 million ton resource on less than 20% of that structure. In addition to this, um, we'll be closing today our previously announced uh, option to pick up five other properties that we believe, again, will have um, other um, ultramafic targets that um, have the potential to deliver additional resource um, into the Crawford project. Uh, the initial resource we delivered at the end of February, I was very happy with. 
Uh, most importantly is is the the this higher grade core. I saw it in the first four discovery holes in this project in late 18. Uh, our drilling that we did through uh, last fall continued to, to highlight this area and it showed up very clearly in the resource. So we had over 260 million tons, grading 0.31% nickel, which is about 15% higher than Dumont, which again is the, the nearest comparable project. Um, most importantly, um, and if you turn to slide 14 here is, you know, within that resources, there was a much higher grade core. So we had uh, 96 million tons at 0.34%, and within that, 28 million tons at 0.38%. Those are 25% and 40% higher grades than the comparable uh, grades um, at, at uh, the overall reserve at Dumont. Those structures come right up to surface, uh, so we'll be able to use those areas as the initial starter pits. Um, and, and again, as we now move into the scoping study, uh, phase of work here, you know, that'll really help underpin what we believe will be very good economics uh, for the project uh, once we get that scoping study completed later this year. Um, again, just zooming in on where we've been drilling to date, um, we've now been stepping out to a number of other targets where we have uh, equally attractive geophysical targets um, that we think will deliver more of that higher grade material and we'll have a whole series of news flow um, on that drilling as we move forward here over the coming months. Uh, with these type of deposits, the key thing is all of the nickel isn't always in a recoverable mineral. So the mineralogy work is a very, very key piece of this. Uh, we've gotten started early on this um, and we continue to advance aggressively on this front. Uh, the good thing is of the first 100 samples we did, you know, almost 90% of the nickel um, is in potentially recoverable minerals in the higher grade core area and 60% in the lower grade uh, zone area. Again, both of those compare very favorably uh, to Dumont. And as we move into the next phase of mineralogy work, we'll be, be doing the recovery testing. You know, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to, you know, deliver, um, you know, um, better results than we saw uh, when we did the work uh, at Dumont um, over the past few years. A nice bonus um, to the nickel that we've been drilling and has been very exciting. And uh, we'll see how this goes as we move forward. Um, you know, there are very few new palladium platinum discoveries globally um, anywhere in the world. You know, and the fact that you know, when we're, we haven't even been drilling for it, that we've hit, you know, one and a half grams of material, basically starting from surface, because that's where the holes were at the, at the northwest corner there. And all the way down to 500 meters deep um, is, is where the structure is sitting. Um, based on the way the geology is, it's the board boundary of a peridotite peroxynite layer. You know, that... Um, layer of PGMs we expect to be, you know, a curtain or wall of PGMs all along uh, the main nickel structures as we continue to drill them forward. So I'll be very excited to see the next series of, of drilling results to see, you know, whether we continue to see this PGM horizon as we move forward. And again, you know, in the main nickel resource, which we published the end of February, we have a total of 400,000 ounces across all categories of PGMs. You know, this has the potential to add substantially to that number, uh, again, which will be a nice byproduct credit as we as we look at, at putting a scoping study uh, together and complete it later this year. Uh, we announced uh, earlier uh, this year that we optioned uh, five properties. Those That transaction should hopefully close uh, later today. Uh, and, and again, this provides the next set of exploration targets after we've completed our initial uh, drilling on Crawford. Um, you know, there are uh, ultra mafic targets on each of these properties. And, you know, our hope is that, you know, of those five properties that we're able to put some sort of resource together um, across two or three of them. It's very early days. We, we're going to take what we know from the geophysics of, of the Crawford target, and then we work that around the different townships to be able to zero in again on adding the highest grade tons. Uh, there's lots of junior mining companies that spend lots of exploration dollars just to add tons and ounces. What we're really focusing in on is on adding value and on adding as many high grade tons as possible. If that adds additional resource tons as we go, that's great, but it's really about finding more of that 0.35% material uh, to fill in as many years uh, as, as uh, for as long as possible uh, of a mine plan that we think, again, will be a very high value project going forward. Um, in terms of where we rank, all the other projects on this list have the inferred resource together. We're not allowed to add that number in. If you add 0.7 to 1.5, you end up with 2.2 million tons, which would make us the 11th largest 
nickel sulfide resource already. And again, that's just on 20% of what we have at Crawford. So we still have a huge amount of room to go. The key thing here is not so much scale for scale's sake. It's when you look at how you know companies are being valued today, the markets outside of the precious metals is really bifurcated into two markets. There are those base metal projects that have the scale that can attract a major. Um, and those are tra trading at sort of what I would call typical valuations that we've historically seen. And then there is everybody else. And, you know, as an investor, you know, in some of those companies, uh, you know, most of those companies are trading within 20 percent uh, of the long term support levels. So it's been very exciting and, and, and important for us to really demonstrate that Crawford uh, clearly has that world scale potential. And based on where it's ranked on these sulfide projects, you know, I think we've clearly demonstrated that fact. Um, valuation wise, the stock has had a great run since we went public. Uh, we initially um, did our initial financing around at 25 cents. Uh, we know we're now at a dollar thirty this morning, and again, you know, given the valuation for some other um, uh, nickel operations that have obviously hit higher grade than us, but you know, don't have a resource yet. I think as we do the additional exploration work, as we do the initial mineralogy work, you know, and as we advance the scoping study, which will be complete by the end of the year, you know, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't trade, you know, in a similar valuation to those companies. You know, longer term, what we're focused on and why I have a, a, a large chunk of my own net worth invested in this company is, is you know, the uh, ultimate realization of that nickel sulfide scarcity value premium. You have one or two large nickel sulfide discoveries per decade. We had Boise's Bay and Cabanga in the, in the 90s. Uh, Cosmos Jubilee and Lionor made some smaller scale sulfide discoveries and rolled them into some larger um, nickel asset plays. And then, you know, I think the, the best example is Serious Resources. Nova Bollinger, like Crawford, was a new nickel discovery. It was discovered in 2012 and three years later was acquired by Independence Group for $1.8 billion. 2015 was hardly a booming uh, market for the mining industry. And again, I think underscores the fact that there are very few high quality nickel sulfide plays. And we think, you know, Crawford, um, you know, will will um, will be of the, the, the quality, uh, again, that should command that scarcity value from all of those majors, all of the electric vehicle industry players who want access to, you know, multi-decade, multi-million ton nickel sulfide resources to support their businesses going forward. We have a very tight capital structure. We are able to get approval for the Noble transaction, which is more than 50% of our shareholder base with a written resolution rather than a shareholder vote because our shareholder structure is relatively compact and we expect to try and keep that as tight as possible moving forward. Uh, so again, you know, we think Crawford um, is, a, is a new nickel sulfide discovery that has world scale potential. Um, we're well financed to, to advance ourselves to our next scoping study milestone. We'll roll right from that scoping study into a feasibility study by year in 2021. The reason we're pushing so aggressively is we want to be ready for what we think is the next nickel super cycle coming um, in the middle part of the 2020s. Uh, with that, I'll conclude my presentation and be glad to answer any questions any of you might have. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the great overview. Um, we do have some questions in. I, I think big picture wise, uh, you know, as this is moving very quickly, you'll have some economics later in the year on it and you'll continue to show that it has uh, even upside on the scale you've done. I mean, when do you think is the right time to bring in a partner? Uh, who are those partners and is it is it the traditional like a mining company or do you see kind of the EV companies kind of taking a look at this type of deposit as well? Yeah, you basically have... With the scale of the project, there's three uh, real categories of, of people who can come into the story. Uh, in terms of when, um, you know, to, to, to do the feasibility study, we'll be looking to raise something in the order of 10 to $20 million. I, you know, I would very much like to have a strategic investor, you know, come into the story at that time. And we're already um, having some of those discussions. And they fall into three buckets. You've got your traditional mid-tier and larger mining companies that are looking to grow their base metal or battery metal business. Uh, secondly, you know, the whole EV chain, unlike, you know, other sort of supply chains which haven't uh, wanted access to raw materials, uh, given how strategic the battery metals are to the overall success of the electric vehicle platform, um, you're going to see more and more participants in that whole uh, EV supply chain, you know, try and get access or preferred access to battery metal resources like our nickel cobalt project. 
Um, and then thirdly, you've got the traditional Japanese and Asian trading houses uh, that, again, are looking for offtake um, and looking for those large multi-decade uh, type resources. You haven't seen that many transactions in the nickel space because the reality is, is there haven't been that many large uh, nickel sulfide projects built uh, globally in the last 20 years. But you know, they've continued to be active in the copper space. I had active discussions with them while I was with RNC around Dumont. Um, and I know that now that nickel is back in favor, you know, we're going to see increased interest from, from all of those groups. Um, BHP Billiton CEO was quoted on their last quarterly call saying, we need more, quote, future facing metals. And, you know, this is from a company and we need more nickel and we mean, need more copper. And this is from a company that spent most of the 2010s trying to sell their nickel business. So if they've done a full 180, like you can be sure that a number of the other large mining companies you know, have changed their, their views on nickel and, and are looking for ways to try and get access to, uh, to good projects in this space. Okay, and then similar on a similar vein, uh, can you comment maybe on on the marketability of the concentrate? And I mean, uh, within the continent or globally, uh, how is capacity, and where does this kind of fit into the scheme of things? You think? Yeah. So, yeah, it's early days. We haven't done the mineralogy network there, but again, sort of re you know relative to where you know Dumont. So Dumont was a forty five percent life of mine recovery to a twenty nine percent con nickel concentrate with a good some cobalt and PGM byproduct credits. Um, because we have more sulfur in the system, I'm hoping that our recovery is gonna be several points higher than Dumont, um, but that extra sulfur is at a trade off of lower concentrate grade of 20 to 25%. Uh, we should have a very significant cobalt byproduct credit in. If you look at the slide in our presentation that has the mineralogy, you can see that the nickel to cobalt content ratio in some of the pentlandite we have is the cobalt content is quite high. And so, you know, I expect to have a very good cobalt concentrate uh, credit going forward. Uh, in terms of global nickel sulfide processing capacity, there isn't a ton of available capacity. Having a nice high grade concentrate, you know, is, is very helpful in terms of being able to feed it into those places in North America. But, you know, what, what is going to happen in the nickel space um, as it has in every other intermediate processing uh, market is the Chinese are are already starting to and will continue build a lot more processing capacity to take nickel intermediates and convert them into usable products for the battery sector. Um, nickel has been an oligopoly historically. Um, that's why it's been sometimes challenging for miners to really extract value from the sector. Um, but you know, for the first time in many, many decades, if ever, in the nickel space, um, you know, we are going to have very competitive markets for intermediates. Um, you know, over the next two, three, four years. And so, you know, we won't, you know, we'll expect to be able to get full value for the nickel and cobalt and the PGMs um, that'll be in our nickel concentrate. Mark, obviously your your baby before this uh, was Dumont. Uh, when you kind of look at the two assets, obviously Dumont is, is a global asset, sizable asset in itself. When you compare and contrast it to, and you see the upside at, uh, at Crawford, uh, how would you address that? Yeah, no, I think the two big differences is one is this is sort of this consistent higher grade core. Um, you know, at Dumont, what we did to get some higher grade material through the mill for the first few years is we mined at almost two and a half times the milling rate. Um, we build up an 85 million ton low grade stockpile. So that's a lot more mining equipment and you have a pile of working capital tied up at the stockpile to be able to get some high grade through. With this high grade core Crawford, we'll be able to mine directly into some higher grade material for a period of time, you know, which should allow us to get away with less mining equipment up front and to avoid having to have a big stockpile at the beginning. Um, the second big difference is in terms of the amount of sulfur, you know, we've got some you know, pretty larger areas with a significant amount of sulfur in there. And in a flotation cell, it's, it's the, you know, the bubbles attached to the sulfur and they pull whatever's attached to it. So the fact that we have more sulfur floating around, you know, should give us a, a good chance of getting higher recovery um, that we, than we were able to get at Dumont. So uh, again, we have, you know, we're just getting into that phase of test work. We'll have to see, you know, what actually happens. But, you know, our, our hope is that, you know, we'll be able to put, a, you know, higher grade material through um, and get and get even better recovery on that. So we'll sort of get a multiplier impact in terms of what the cash flow impact would look like that in a scoping study. You know, that's why I'm so keen and, and to push to get that scoping study done by the end of the year. So we can really highlight to investors what kind of economics and what kind of project value we're really looking at here. Okay, I mean, as you as you develop that scoping study on on what you're drilling now, uh, you mentioned again you have a tremendous amount of strike and 
I've I, we've been the site together. I've seen the core, uh, the the continuity uh, on strike, but also downhole has been, is extremely favorable. Uh, so it's not hard to imagine this growing on strike. I mean, how are you splitting? Uh, what are the plans to drill beyond uh, kind of where the the resource footprint is today? Yeah. So there's really two main focuses. So there's one which are the step outs, and again, you know, the, the, that continuity is a very important point. You know. Again, every every miner would love to have you know sexy high grade you know intersections, but you know what we make up for is in terms of the scale and the continuity of it. So unlike some of the high grade projects that have done ten meter and twenty meter step outs, we're doing one kilometer step outs. You know right. that's the kind of step outs that, with the understanding that we have of the deposit and the nature of the deposit itself, you can make those you know massive resource leaps um, and add a huge amount of nickel resource with a relatively small amount of exploration dollars. So you know we'll be targeting where we think around that eight kilometers of target, uh, where we think we can find more of that high grade core type material, uh, and then the second piece is is just infill drilling on the main anomaly itself, main zone itself, so that um, you know, when we go into scoping study, that that higher grade core, you know, we've got upgraded um, as much as possible to make sure we can again maximize um, how that gets modeled and gets put through the early years of uh, early years of the mine plan. Right. And then on that vein, you mentioned it. Uh, it was a good description to call it a PGM curtain. Um, you're obviously that, again that looks to be potentially pervasive uh, along. The, the nickel uh, is yeah. that fall into the same pit and then, and then how meaningful I guess uh, big picture wise could that be to the nickel deposit itself yeah so we'll have to see it, it sort of step back anywhere from kind of 100 to 200 meters um, um, from the nickel so whether I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly how that'll end up getting sequenced um, into the pit or whether it'll be mined separately and then sort of cannibalized when the pit eventually gets out um, to that kind of a, a pit wall distance mm -hmm. um, the the, the, the key thing is it will end up being a very nice additional byproduct credit. You know, we've got roughly 400,000 of ounces uh, of PGMs already in the resource. Um, you know, that PGM curtain, uh, you know, if you just multiply the math out over a pretty distant horizon and a distant, pretty deep, deep depth, um, you can easily get to multi hundred thousand type ounce uh, PGM resource. And so, you know, being able to just blend that into the overall, you know, if you're having a thousand or 2000 tons a day from that, um, um, that resource get blended into a much larger mining operation, you know, that becomes some very juicy cream that, you know, gets, gets, gets added in every year. And again, I'll be very helpful, you know, for the overall project economics. Yeah, great. And Mark, again, I think it's a point worth uh, making again, there's a question on just kind of infrastructure, obviously off the highway, power lines, not, but there's also uh, Kid Creek is there. Just yeah. any general comments on just that part of the world and, and what's available? Yeah. So, you know, the, the key question there is, is you know, Kid um, current phase of, of, of mining is scheduled to close 2021, 2022. Um, they are looking at extending the mine uh, deeper. Um, using electric mining equipment, um, you know, we'll see where that lands. Um, but you know, we, we'll see there. There's basically the Kid Met site has been largely decommissioned. There's just the mill there, so you have a basically a large concrete pad that has, you know, uh, all of the infrastructure that you would need to have a you know significant operation. You know, whether we can use that, you know, that'll be question one. And you know, there there is obviously some potential to be able to use that. You know, two. You know, at what price will Glencore, you know, do a deal to allow us to take advantage of some of that infrastructure? But you know, the nice thing, it, it is an option. It's there, and you know, we'll have those discussions and negotiations uh, with Glencore when the time comes. I have very, very good relationship with the entire Glencore Nickel team. So, um, you know, hopefully those discussions will start sooner than later, based on you know what we're, we've been uncovering at the project. No, that's great, Mark. We're pushing on a half an hour, so we'll cut it off there. But maybe just uh, any closing statement you'd like to make before before we sign off? Yeah, no, I think, you know, if you're an investor and you're listening to the call, I mean, you know, don't wait um, too long. Um, you know, we've taken this project from a you know, starting point you know, just over six months ago and have already turned it into the 11th largest resource. 
Um, we're pushing very hard on multiple fronts and we're going to unlock a lot of value again here over the next six months. So I would encourage you to, you know, buy early, buy often, um, you know, and I think, you know, over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months here, um, you're, you're getting in early days on what we think is going to be one of those, um, you know, great nickel super cycles um, that will hopefully be all be able to, uh, to, uh, you know, profit from. So, and I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to hear the story. Great, uh, Mark, uh, pleasure having you. Uh, thank you for your support of Red Cloud and uh, uh, best of luck. Thanks everyone for joining. All right, thanks Chad, take care.